Thanks for your support. Uh, well, on behalf of St James Ethics Centre, uh, which presents these debates, which probably explains why there's all this St James Ethics Centre stuff around uh, tonight, uh, somehow or other we've realised about uh, now, after four years of doing this, that people didn't quite understand that it was us actually doing it. Uh, <laughs> hence the disclosure. On our own behalf, on behalf of the Sydney Morning Herald, AMP, the City of Sydney and the ABC, I'd like to welcome you to the City Recital Hall in Angel Place for what is the last, the fifth and final in our 2011 series of debates in the Intelligence Squared um, program. Now, the topic before the House tonight is that democracy is failing the planet. And this is, I think, a really germane issue to be addressing. Uh, we just have to look at the conversations that arose after the US Congress struggled for such a long time to deal with its debt issues, uh, to look at the riots in London, to look at the situation unfolding in Greece and other European countries, to see why it is that people are wondering about the capacity of democracy to deal with the issues that are before us um, as a people all around the world. I was really struck at a function I attended about six weeks ago when a person who was born in India uh, stood up and said, I'd rather be a poor Chinese than a poor Indian. Uh, the implication being that, yes, India had democracy, but wouldn't it be better to be poor living in a country with a capacity to deal immediately with the issues that might be affecting your welfare? Of course, there are many people, and we're going to hear from some of them tonight, who would strongly disagree with that person. They'd say, no, you just don't know what you might be giving away. So that's the general dimensions for the debate we're going to have this evening. I'm going to introduce to you the speakers for the proposition and then against the proposition. I'll introduce all three on one side. Please welcome them then, and then we'll do the same with the negative. Opening the debate for the affirmative is Professor Clive Hamilton, who's Professor of Public Ethics and holds the Vice-Chancellor's Chair at Charles Sturt University. He was the founder and for 14 years the Executive Director of the Australia Institute, a public interest think tank. He's well known in Australia as a public intellectual and for his contributions to public policy debate. Now, I'd have to say he's one of Australia's leading public intellectuals. His extensive publications include writings on climate change policy, overconsumption, welfare policy and the effects of commercialisation. Amongst other titles, he's the author of Affluenza and Requiem for a Species. And I'd say he's a pretty handy philosopher as well, having seen some of his work in that area. He's joined by Cheryl Curnow, Director of Social Business at the Centre for Social Impact at the University of New South Wales, and is also Chair of the Fair Trade Association for Australia and New Zealand. She was formerly um, one of the leader of the Australian Democrats in the mid-1990s, became a Labor Shadow Minister for three years, and is currently one of the National Trust's 100 National Living Treasures. Her policy interests have been in social justice and social structural reform. She was Program Director at the Saeed Business School at Oxford University and Director of Learning at the School for Social Entrepreneurs in London. And finally, they're joined by Luca belgiorno Nettis, Joint Managing Director of Transfield Holdings and founder of the New Democracy Foundation. And thanks to that foundation, it's been tremendous in its support for tonight's debate. Their purpose is to research new forms of government. belgiorno Nettis holds a Bachelor of Architecture from the University of New South Wales, a graduate diploma in urban estate management from UTS. He's a director of a number of not-for-profit boards and committees, including chairman of the Biennale of Sydney, UTS, and the University of Western Sydney. In 2007, he was awarded the Chancellor's Award for Excellence at UTS for his contribution to Sydney's culture. Please welcome them all. We might have um, virtually every one of the Sydney's major institutions in the higher education sector, at least the universities mentioned tonight, because leading the team for the negative is Professor Stephen Schwartz, the Vice-Chancellor of Macquarie University and a former Vice-Chancellor of Brunel University in the UK and Murdoch University in Perth. His academic research spanned clinical psychology, psychiatry, public health and medical decision making, and he was named one of the 100 most cited researchers in his field. Professor Schwartz is a fellow of the Australian Institute of Company Directors and the Australian Institute of Management. He's a member of the Fulbright Commission and the advisory boards of the Asia Society, the Global Foundation and the Centre for Independent Studies. And he used to debate in the junior 
uh, of the, old, the two old debating societies, the Oxford one, which of course the Oxford Union started after the Cambridge one, which I should mention as a Cambridge man myself. <laughs> we forgive you. He forgives me. Martine Letts joins them. She's the Deputy Director of the Lowy Institute for International Policy, former Secretary General, that is the CEO of the Australian Red Cross. She served as the Australian Ambassador to Argentina, Uruguay and Paraguay. Deputy Head of Mission and Australian Deputy Permanent Representative to the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, and as an advisor to Foreign Minister Gareth Evans from 1992 to 1994. Martine specialised in arms control and disarmament on postings in Geneva and Vienna, and acted as policy officer in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And last but not least is Professor John Keane, who's Professor of Politics at the University of Sydney and at the Wissenschaftszentrum. Berlin. He's the director of the recently founded Sydney Democracy Initiative. During his time in Britain, the Times ranked him one of the country's leading political thinkers and a writer whose work had worldwide importance. The Australian Broadca Broadcasting Commission recently described him as one of the great intellectual exports from Australia, and we're pleased to say he's come back home. His book, The Life and Death of Democracy, was shortlisted for the 2010 non-fiction Prime Minister's Literary Award. Would you please welcome the speakers for the negative. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the proposition before this House is that democracy is failing the planet. I now invite the first speaker for the affirmative, Professor Clive Hamilton, to outline his case. In April this year, the following proposition was put to the US House of Representatives. Congress accepts the scientific findings that climate change is occurring, is caused largely by human activities, and poses significant risks for public health and welfare. The House, dominated by the Tea Party, voted 240 to 184 to reject the basic propositions of climate science as if American lawmakers had a mandate to vote down the laws of physics. This act of congressional hubris alone is enough to prove the proposition that democracy is failing the planet. But since I have to speak for nine minutes, let me elaborate. <laughs> since the founding of modern science, matters of fact have been established through the common assent of those qualified to judge using the rules of science laid down in the 17th century by the Royal Society. The break from the past lay in the fact that the potency of knowledge came from nature, not from privileged persons, such as the church. This is the foundation of the Enlightenment, the age of reason. However, the practices of democracy at times do not sit comfortably with the best advice of those most qualified and knowledgeable. Over the last decade or so, politically driven climate deniers have adroitly used the instruments of democratic practice to erode the authority of professional expertise. They have attempted, with considerable success, to undermine the authority of climate science by skillful exploitation of a free media, appeal to freedom of information laws, the mobilisation of a group of vociferous citizens and the promotion of their own to public office. In this way, democracy has defeated science. And not just in the United States, of course. In Australia, those who reject the established rules of science now occupy positions of great influence. The chairman of the ABC, the head of the Catholic Church, the editor-in-chief of the National Daily Newspaper, our most famous poet, our loudest squawking shock jock, <laughs> and of course the alternative prime minister, climate deniers one and all, men who reject the rules of science laid down in the Enlightenment, who believe every scientific academy in the world is engaged in a giant conspiracy to deceive us, and who use the instruments of democracy to try to prevent us from protecting ourselves, our children, and future generations from an unpleasant future in a hothouse world. 
Yet our opponents tonight insist that democracy is serving the planet well. What sort of democracy can they have in mind? Now, John Keane, of course, is a world expert. In his uh, great and widely praised tome on the life and death of democracy, he tells us that democracy must be, quote, freed from the pride and prejudice of moguls and magnates. Is our democracy free from the pride and prejudice of Twiggy Forrest, Gina Reinhart and Clive Palmer? Professor Keane writes that democracy thrives on humility. But isn't it the pinnacle of hubris for scientifically unqualified politicians like Tony Abbott and Nick Minchin to believe that they know better than every science academy in the world? If democracy is a code word for humility, then we must live in a dictatorship. And it's this dictatorship of ignorance that's failing the planet. Our opponents will tell you not to worry, that democracy will soon catch up with science and everything will turn out well. Sadly, science says otherwise. Science says carbon dioxide persists in the atmosphere for a thousand years. And by the, by the time democracy catches up with scientific truth, the horse will have bolted. In an interview last month, Australia's alternative prime minister was asked why he shares platforms with people who accuse CSIRO scientists of being crooks and frauds, of engaging in a conspiracy. He replied, quote, the CSIRO obviously has a position. What a revealing slip. For him, science is just another form of politics and scientific bodies are just political actors like the Australian Coal Association or Greenpeace. So in Mr Abbott's world, the Garvin Institute has a position on the link between smoking and lung cancer. The Geological Society of Australia has a position on the age of the earth. And the Australian Institute of Physics has a position on the general theory of relativity. <laughs> we thought he was a conservative, but Tony Abbott is the ultimate postmodernist who believes that all science is socially constructed, that the accumulation of evidence is governed by ideology, that science itself cannot be distinguished from belief. Now, a free press, of course, is essential to democracy. There can be no real democracy without a well-informed citizenry. But a free press can also subvert the democratic process, and there's no better illustration of this danger than the relentless campaign by Rupert Murdoch's broadsheet, The Australian, to subvert climate science, a campaign described in devastating detail by Robert Mann in his recent quarterly essay. Here is a newspaper that loves to ridicule our most distinguished scientists at every opportunity and devotes acres of space to the ravings of climate deniers like the loopy Lord Monckton. Murdoch's News Limited accounts for 70% of newspaper circulation in Australia. The papers are dominated by climate-denying zealots like Andrew Bolt, Janet Albrechtson, Christopher Pearson and Piers Ackerman. They're all there, ideological warriors bent on defeating environmentalism. They remind me of the US major in the Vietnam War who famously said, that it was necessary to destroy the village in order to save it from communism. Murdoch's climate deniers now find it necessary to destroy the world in order to save it from environmentalism. The democratic right of the Australian to tell lies about climate science has set back action on climate change in this country by a decade and would be well served if the Australian went the way of that other pillar of the Murdoch empire, the news of the world. Hacking the phone of a dead schoolgirl is unforgivable. Yet, when the news of the world is but a distant memory, we will be living every day with the consequences of the Australian's war on science. I confess, I've been a casualty of that war. I once acknowledged in a public forum 
that some people have become so alarmed at our failure to respond to the scientific warnings about global warming that they have talked about suspending democracy. I've always rejected the idea uh, as impractical and, well, anti-democratic, declaring over and over that the failure of democracy calls not for its suspension, but it, for its reinvigoration. But that hasn't stopped the Australian repeatedly claiming that I've called for the suspension of democracy. It's too good a lie not to repeat. It's because too many lies are being told that democracy is failing the planet. Yet we have no alternative but to use democracy to save democracy from failing us. I commend the motion to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have to congratulate the first speaker, Clive Hamilton, on his lucid and his cunning presentation. Nobody in this audience could fail to be impressed by the gallant fashion in which he attempted to deal with such a palpably indefensible case. His eloquence made me wish that he actually had taken the trouble to talk about the motion before the House. <laughs> Democracy is failing the planet. Yes, indeed, stupidity could be failing the planet, and there are plenty of stupid people in the world. There are people who don't believe climate science. There are people who don't believe that vaccines prevent disease. There are people who don't believe the theory of evolution. There are people who don't believe more or less anything you can find to believe in. That's denial, that's stupidity. How does that argue against democracy? But it was an excellent speech. I do think that Clive has actually set a standard for irrelevance which he has on many occasions aspired to. <laughs> and everyone in this audience, I think, will feel a bit of compassion for Cheryl and Luca now that the first speaker has deserted them. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, democracy is not failing the planet. On contrary, democracy is the only thing that can save the planet and humanity at the same time. Let me give you just one example. The Great Bengal Famine of 1943 killed three million people. And yet the food output in 1943 was exactly the same as in 1942 and in 1941 in that area of India. So what happened? Why did people starve when the same amount of food was available? Well, it was the middle of the Second World War and the urban areas of Bengal were experiencing a huge economic boom. There were soldiers to equip, there were munitions factories to build, there were construction workers to house, and the result was inflation. That increased prices, which led to panic buying, which led to hoarding. The hoarding caused more shortages, and it served to increase prices even further. Landless laborers from the country Low-skilled workers from the city did not have enough money to buy the food. So the landless, the lowly, the poor starved to death. Now you may be wondering what's this got to do with the motion and democracy. So let me give you my takeaway point right here. The Bengal famine was not caused by a lack of food. It was caused by a lack of democracy. In this, indeed, this was the major insight of Amartya Sen, the Nobel laureate economist. You see, the British Raj had severe restrictions on the press, not perhaps as severe as what Clive wants to impose on the Australian, but severe nevertheless. They ensured there was no reporting of the famine. Outside of those affected, there were few people who realized that thousands were dying every week. There was no parliament in India to discuss the famine, no functioning parliament, 
There was nobody there to hold an inquiry. There were no MPs to petition. There were no ministers to force the colonial administrators to provide the starving poor with welfare or government jobs so they could afford to buy food. Millions died because they didn't have democracy to protect them. The same thing happened in Ireland in the potato famine of the 1840s, and it happened again in China with the largest famine that was ever recorded in history. It began with a great leap forward and the forced collectivization of farms. That famine lasted for three years, from 58 to 61, and 30 million people died before the Chinese government actually changed their policy. And why? Because there were no democratic mechanisms by which to effect change. There was no parliament to discuss the famine. There was no free press. Famines thrive under authoritarian regimes, one-party states, and dictatorships. North Korea being the most modern and recent example. And of course, it's the poor and the weak who starve. The rulers are always well fed. Why is it that only democracies can cope with famine? Well, that's because democratic governments are accountable to the people. The press is free and public criticism can end political careers. Democratic governments, politicians, that wish to be in power, respond to criticism. They have to respond to lobbying. They have to respond to the citizens. They have to if they want to keep their jobs. And that's the essence of democracy. It's the public deliberation of problems and solutions. That's the real essence of democracy. It's not the technicalities of elections or apportionment or any other mechanical process. It's government by free and open public discussion. That's what characterizes democracies. India has had no famines since it became a democracy. In fact, no famine has ever occurred in a functioning democracy, one with regular elections, opposition parties, free speech, and a free press. Now, people from Tunisia to Tibet know this, from Liberia to Libya, from Somalia to Syria. They all know it, and that's why they're risking their lives for democracy. But here in Australia, we are beginning to take it for granted. And it reminds me of the famous story of the traveling salesman who comes to the farm and is asked to spend the night. He comes down to eat dinner with the table, and he finds a pig seated at the table. The pig has three medals hanging around his neck and a wooden leg. The salesman says, Oh, I see that you have a pig eating dinner with you. Oh, yes, says the farmer, but that's because he's a very special pig. See those medals around his neck? Well, the first one is from when our youngest, self, youngest son fell in the pond, and he was drowning, and that pig swam out, grabbed our son, and pulled him back to shore. And the second medal, that's from when the barn caught on fire and a little girl was trapped in there. And that pig ran inside and carried our daughter out to safety. And the third medal, well, that's from when the oldest boy was cornered in the stockyard by a mean bull. And that pig ran under the fence, bit the bull on the tail, and saved that boy's life. Well, yes, said the salesman. I can see why you let that pig sit right at the table and why you have dinner with you, and I can see why you awarded him all those medals. But tell me, how did he get that wooden leg? Oh, well, said the farmer, a pig like that, you don't eat him all at once. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the opposition are making the same mistake that a farmer made. They are taking for granted what other people around the world are dying for. Yes, there are people in the world who don't understand science. Anything can be denied. But one thing that can be denied is that democracy is not failing the planet. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the only thing that can save the planet. Thank you. Cheryl Kernow.
I put it to the House that democracy is failing the planet and I know the House knows it. And despite our little culinary digression via potatoes, pigs and lack of food, I put it to you that it's time to hold up the notion of democracy to the glare of the light and to question the accepted wisdom that it's a really worthy and successful concept. The best system we have on offer, working magnificently compared with dictatorships. Yes, it can be all of these things and still fail the planet. Hitler was elected democratically, by the way. So I put it to the House that right now, not in Bengal in 1943 or the potato famine of the past, right now on this planet, we have reached a point where failures, which have been amassing nationally and globally, have now reached compelling evidence that democracy, as it is most commonly practised, has delivered both entrenched power to the elected and unelected elites, and also timidity, bias and paralysis in our representative decision-making processes. And all of this is resulting in mass crises that are undermining the planet's and its species' future. Environmental crises, health crises, economic crises, crises in the failure of political will. The most common form of democracy practice today is representative democracy. And we recognise the characteristics of free and fair elections where every vote has equal weight, even those of the stupid, and where no unreasonable restrictions apply to anyone seeking to stand for election. Here in Australia, we quite fancy ourselves. Our national identity is a bit tired with being a, tied to being a pioneering democracy because we invented the Australian ballot and preferential voting. But like citizens in other Western democracies, we groan about but tolerate the reality that free and fair <coughs> elections are in fact very expensive. We all wonder how democratic it is to have to raise millions to even contemplate being a candidate for US president. And we suffer in common with other Western democracies those stage campaigns to secure our votes, where two competitors wastefully jump into private jets, crisscrossing their continent, gaff-seeking journalists in tow, offering even more special promises to those in marginal seats whose votes in our democracy now seem to count a little more than others. Keystone Cops has absolutely nothing on this downward spiral of exhaustion and banality and character assassination in the name of democratic free speech. But democracy's new invention saves us in the form of the majority vote of a worm wielded by 30 or so allegedly representative people speaking for all of us. And then in the spirit of Professor Keane's view that democracy thrives on humility, on election night, the winning team claims a mandate for every syllable uttered in the preceding 28 days and promises to govern hand on heart democratically for all of us. Then there's fair and free elections, where results and promises can be influenced by donors' money and advertising budgets and opinion polling. But this infrastructure is supported by democratically voted electoral laws. In Australia, donations don't have to be disclosed until six months after the election. So we can't make the link between money given and promises which may have been made. Think New South Wales and planning decisions. But we feel humbly reassured that democracy prevails when elections force teams to swap sides on the Chamber of Government every few years or so, and then it doesn't matter what they do with the opportunity once they get there. This is the, the democracy we consume and apply in the Western world. But it's the cumulative effect of this that matters. The cumulative effect of these three, four, and five yearly exercises in democracy as it is practised today is to co confirm frustration and cynicism and ultimate disengagement. And where citizens are cynical and disengaged, a retreat to individualism is common. 
Collective will is undermined, and so too the commitment to support decisions which involve some sacrifice in the present to protect the future for those who inherit the planet from us. And that's one fundamental way in which democracy is currently failing the planet. We have been allowed to deny our moral responsibility for creating intergenerational equity. We borrow from the future to pay for the present. And what we've come to today in most Western democracies, particularly where voting is not compulsory, is not a democracy of all citizens, but of those who actually go to the polls. And what for? Really, primarily to entrench and defend the economic and social advantage that the system has created for them. Think middle class welfare, think tax cuts for the very wealthy, think lobby groups with more money for advertising campaigns and governments. I've heard it said that democracy is merely a state of anarchy among various pressure groups these days. And then we have the oppositionism of oppositions, where any um, notion of consensus around the common good is automatically rejected and the focus is on the destruction of the government of the day, little regard for anything beyond the next election. And when our current elected, democratically elected representatives are not capitulating to rich miners or bankers, they're retreating in silence from the loaded campaigns run by unelected and invariably unaccountable media, or they're spinning like hell in a vain attempt to influence it, even the Greens. This is not a corruption of democracy by party politics. This is actually the democratic system within which political parties operate and perpetuate the status quo. Global democracy is failing the planet in its failure to ensure peace and timely conflict resolution. The United Nations, formed essentially by the victors of the Second World War, willfully denies the collective global democratic will to remove the veto from the Security Council where a club of five of the world's most powerful nations shapes international peace and security. And so the Israel-Palestine continues, conflict continues 60 years on. As a former big D and little d Democrat with an idealistic attachment to the power of democracy, I now understand a different truth that it is not democracy or the big democratic institutions that are successfully addressing poverty alleviation and economic and environmental justice on which a fair and peaceful and sustainable planet is built. It is in fact individuals who actually see the failure of the planet's democratic systems as a call to action. Individuals like Mohammed Yunus who in the pioneering of microfinance and the scale of its replication means that loans to very poor families now touch the lives of more than half a billion family members around the world, half the world's poorest people, delivering both food and democratic participation at the village level. And the two young American founders who married microfinance and Web2 platforms to create Kiva an online social investment website where you and I can bypass the top-down failed aid policy of the, of the past and directly invest in the future of other individuals in the developing world. These new alliances of social entrepreneurs and social investors do more now to create peace and economic equality than our failed democratic institutions of the last half century. The most important lesson of Jared Diamond's book, Collapse, is that the societies most able to avoid collapse are the ones that are the most agile. That is not us. We are stuck in fixed and destructively inflexible and unresponsive processes that stymie collective political will. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, so far I've heard that indolence, apathy, laziness, greed, 
out-of-date international institutions, human beings are destroying the planet. I haven't yet, or, and, and, I, and, and are not, and are also um, not meeting the planet's best interests or failing the planet. Uh, I would like to say that the fact that we've heard so much about individuals' voices and individuals' ideas would suggest to me that the way in that we can continue to hear them and the way in which we continue to be influenced by their ideas uh, are through democratic systems rather than systems that are not de democratic that would silence their voices. But I'm going to turn my gaze now onto, onto the globe. And in a globalised world, the planet doesn't need less democratic governance, it needs better democratic governance for the big issues of our time for managing the future of the planet. To argue otherwise would actually be on the wrong side of history. We need democracy for peace and security, for development, for protecting the environment and combating global warming and for fostering the innovation needed to secure the planet's future. Democracy remains the best protection against some of the great threats to these vital goals. Oppression, corruption, unprovoked aggression. Democracy is the ultimate safety valve in times of turmoil. When you can go to the ballot box to vent your frustration, you are less likely to have to kill or be killed for your beliefs or sullenly obey silly new laws. I wonder whether any of you remember Woody Allen's film Bananas in 1971. Woody Allen is a successful revolutionary who becomes president of the fictional country of San Marcos whereupon he loses his sanity and democratic idealism by declaring that from now on, the official language of San Marcos, which is obviously Latin American country, will now be Swedish. And uh, that in addition, all citizens will be required to wash their underwear every half hour. And furthermore, their underwear will be worn outside their clothes to allow for regular inspection. <laughs> now, while democracy, especially in its infancy, is fragile and reversible, how many in the world today would willingly surrender power and privilege to the hands of the insane or the hands of the few, no matter how knowledgeable or competent they might be? Democracy helps build legitimacy within states and between states, and it is the fundament on which predictable international relations are built and sustained. We know that autocratic, corrupt regimes breed instability, fear, and impede economic development. Who would argue that a democratic Indonesia today is not better, not only for Indonesia, but for Australia and for the region? And despite the terrorist incidents, and despite the Bali boy, which in the larger scheme of things is a bit of a blip in the relationship, we are far more secure with our largest neighbour as a flourishing democracy. From my personal experience as an arms control negotiator, I know success lies in a process where all views have been heard, where common ground is found in open debate for securing an enduring agreement, for securing international legitimacy and widespread adherence. And after all, it's widespread adherence to global treaties, that's the name of the game here, whether for the control of weapons of mass destruction or for protecting the environment, for laws of war or for the control of the harmful effects of radiation to world trade. Democracies are the least likely to go with war with one another. Rules of totalitarian regimes or rulers of totalitarian regimes are more likely to revert to violence in order to secure their reign. Just ask the citizens of Libya, Syria, Bahrain. They command obedience, even though they have to use violence. Why? Because for them, it's a zero-sum game. The environment needs democracy. Uh, we've already heard about how important the environment is, the great challenge of our time from our first speaker. Do you remember what communist Europe did to the environment? Do you remember what happened to the Aral Sea? That's just one example, which has been referred to as the unique monument to the damage caused by central planning and totalitarianism. Lack of openness and authoritarianism increased the numbers of deaths from the Chernobyl disaster and sent Europe into a panic which endures today. Antarctica is the last pristine region of the world and essential to ecological balancing. Who's most interested in exploring minerals in Antarctica after the current treaty runs out? China and Russia. They don't care what the people think or about global environmental needs. No wise guardians will persuade them otherwise. International surveys show that leaders in democratic regimes are more likely to adopt environmentally friendly policies 
and improved environmental protection than their counterparts in authoritarian ones. And a number of empirical studies have documented the very positive income that transition to democracy has had for environmental governments. Countries such as Chile in Latin America, Poland in Eastern Europe, Taiwan in Asia are three such examples. More civic participation may slow down environmental policy making, I'll give you that, but it helps to ensure a stronger government commitment to protecting broad-based environmental interests, and that will have to be extrapolated internationally too. And a little democracy goes a long way for the environment. Just think of the Chinese and even the Burmese who have protested about certain projects now with good effect for the environment. Now, if anything will save the planet, it has to be innovation. Innovation flourishes in a democratic system. It provides breathing space for experimentation and for mistakes. Genuine innovation, as opposed to re-engineering the ideas of others, can only come from flexible, creative and inventive culture that emerges from a competitive market economy backed up by democracy and the rule of law. I don't yet know about uh, a Steve Jobs from China or from Vietnam or from Russia. Maybe that's still to come. Andrei Kolesnikov from Novaya Gazeta wrote that President Medvedev is attempting, just like Peter the Great, Stalin, Khrushchev and Brezhnev before him, to import technological know-how into Russia from the West, lest the reforms necessary for the development of an innovative culture at home threaten Russia's social order and the existing power structure. Developed democracies like Germany invest eight times as much as Russia in innovation. Russian products account for 0.4% of total volume of industrial production. Little Finland comes to 16%. Tellingly, 98.5% of patentable innovations are created by 50% of the world's population, and industrialized Russia is not among them. Now, people around the world want democracy. We know that from polling. But they don't want it imposed, unless they're Swiss, where everything is either compulsory or forbidden. <laughs> but even in Fiji, where a recent Lowy Institute poll records that 66% of Fijians think dictator Bainarama is doing a good job, 98% said the right to freely vote in national elections, the right to freely express yourself, and the right to a fair trial was important to them. And 96% said the right to a media free from censorship was important to them. In the absence of democracy, we witness increased levels of corruption, erosion of human rights, and unbalanced distribution of resources. Corruption is one of the most powerful impediments to development, and democracy provides a stable environment to conduct business at all levels. You just have to take one look at the corruption index to see where most of the countries sit. The highest percentage are in poor, underdeveloped countries. True democracy enfranchises women and unlocks 50% of the world's productive potential, and basic rights for women are particularly absent in undemocratic countries. So, democracy may have made us lazy, given us a sense of entitlement, but it's our lack of engagement, not democracy, which is failing the planet. In authoritarian states, it is lack of democracy that is failing the planet. With all its imperfections, there is no other system which can muster the numbers and legitimacy needed for tackling the big global issues I've referred to this evening. Luca Belgiorno Nittis. Th I must start by saying thank you to Simon Longstaff and the St James Ethics Centre for doing such good things. Thank you. We are here tonight to consider how our system of government impacts on our planet. Some of you of my generation might remember a publication called The Last Whole Earth Catalogue. It was back in 1973. In the inside front cover, there was that famous picture of the Apollo, that the, the Apollo 8 astronauts took of the Earth rising over the moon's surface. Yeah, this picture, in this picture, there was the little blue planet there. Next to it was some text with the words that read, the flow of energy through a system acts to organize that system. These were the words of a 
of a US biophysicist called Harold Morowitz. They're kind of self-evident. Let me say them again. The, the energy, the flow of energy through a system acts to organize that system. I'd like to consider the energy in this room tonight. When we debate, as we are doing here this evening, we seek to divide our opinion. We seek to divide our energies. As entertaining and informative as it is, with my superb team here, lined up against our respected colleagues in opposition, the flow of energy does not encourage common ground. It's not meant to. Imagine instead if the six of us were, were all deliberating together with you as well. I'd be more confident of a better energy, a better outcome. I know because I've done it with a crowd of people almost this size before. I know because it's for us, by us, of us. A little plagiarising there of uh, Mr Lincoln. <laughs> I think democracy can be defined as a system, a system to organise ourselves for no other reason but for ourselves. I'd like to repeat that. I kind of like that. I think democracy can be defined as a system, a system to organise ourselves for no other reason but for ourselves. I'm sometimes asked what got me into political reform. I work in a family business uh, as an architect in and around infrastructure projects and in that experience I came across governments of all persuasions and I found too often that good projects were being compromised by political expediency. I cite one example here which is the Sydney public transport system. So together with some like-minded colleagues, Cathy Jones, Lynn Carson, Ian Marsh, and we garnered some support from some distinguished ex-politicians, Fred Cheney, uh, John Button, bless his soul, uh, Jeff Gallup and Nick Greiner, we formed a research organisation called the New Democracy Foundation. We all thought we could do democracy better somehow. Debating entrenches division from the outset. It's a microcosm of how we do democracy today. Let's call it flawed democracy. We pit candidate against candidate in a winner-takes-all contest. The adversarial model of democracy, this flawed demo model, is all that most people know of democracy. When we say democracy is failing the planet, we say, of course it is. We're too busy bickering to bother about the planet. How can we expect to save the planet when we can't even save ourselves? Some might say that Australia has been well served by its governments for many generations. Others might say that the Aboriginal Australians were well served by their government for many more generations before. John Button said, this generation needs a new involving mechanism. I think there is a palpable sense of unease with the way we do politics. There is such divisive, divisiveness in our political landscape, not just here, but also abroad. Just look at the US of A. That country's politics is hardly, hardly inspiring. Its popular media is verging on the rabid, full of vitriolic, jingoistic sloganism. New media may bring connectivity, but it also fragments. And popular media somehow seems stronger than ever. In the centenary of Marshall McLuhan's birth, I'm, we're, we're inspired by his uh, turn of phrase. The medium is the message. The medium is the massage. The medium is the mass age. But no media in this mass age is yet to provide a deliberative space. Our parliaments, as the first and last bastions of deliberation, are struggling, struggling because our politicians are busy debating to win the popular vote. This is where the energy is flowing. This looks like 
must be the politics of populism, more so than ever. So what can be done? When democracy was originally conceived in Greece, it was nothing like what we practice today. The Greeks didn't vote for candidates. They elected their representatives by sortition, a random selection of the citizen class. They then voted on the issue. Their model had no campaigning or lobbying to win office. Our model is fundamentally different. It's based on the one that the American founding fathers established. They established the model for voting for candidates. The founding fathers actually rejected the very word democracy. They preferred the term natural aristocracy. This model, our model, pits candidate against candidate. We've groomed charismatic and articulate political performers whose primary skill is to debate, divide and conquer. Resolving issues of government have become secondary. But it's not the fault of the politicians. It's the system we've all signed up to. The adversarial energies of our system make our system adversarial. It's systemic. I ask, how can we reinvent our democracy? If the problem is adversarial politics, then we need to consider other models that are less adversarial, models that rely less on elections, that promote common ground, that have better deliberation, models such as Alex Sakaris's Citizen Senate or John Bernheim's Demarchy or even Confucian Democracy or many other models. Many of the models have sortition, just like the Greeks. They are not voted in, they are not career politicians, these representatives are not campaigning candidates. They are not beholden to opinion polls, shock jocks or focus groups. I think, together with my colleagues, that it would be good to set up a review panel to review these models. We think that a panel is best constituted by a sortition process as well. It's amazing to realise that ordinary citizens, when they deliberate together, are quite extraordinary. The citizens' jury is the proof, played out in our courts every day of every week. And so is the research evidence, proof that a diverse group are often better than a panel of so-called experts. Once we see our democracy is flawed, the challenge and the opportunity is to believe in ourselves. When we are engaged, not simply as voters in an adversarial contest, we are more intelligent than we think. Democracy is defined in every handbook as free and fair elections, except the first book on the subject. We could carry on as we are, infecting life and our planet with bickering, vitriol and division. Or we could try and break the habits of the life of a lifetime, break the contract with its flawed democracy to try and save ourselves as well as our planet. Thank you. John, John Key. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in the language of uh, the late 18th century, citizens and citizenesses of, of the house, you know that among the very good things about democracy is that you don't have to love or like your opponents. When it takes root, in fact, democracy turns uh, political enemies into political opponents, into debating partners with whom you put up, sometimes ask to shut up, and to whom you can say very harsh things. So I shall practice the feisty knockabout art for which I'm going to plead. I begin with the obvious, for it's easy to spot two immediate difficulties for our opponents. First, our democracy-shy opponents are caught in a double bind, what the philosophers call a performative contradiction, which is to say uh, that they say that democracy is failing the planet, and by implication they make the case against democracy, using various words, by utilizing the very freedoms, the public spaces, even the public service media they otherwise rail against. They embrace what they want to reject. It's an old pattern, I warn you, in the history of democracy and among its opponents. Singular minds, 
with two faces. Second, the case of our distinguished antagonists is contradicted, I put to you, by the fact that in our Asia and Pacific region, broadly defined to include the space stretching from the Gulf states, Iran, Pakistan in the West, through the Central Asian republics to China and Japan and around uh, through Indonesia and Australia, New Zealand and Pacific states such as Fiji, we not only find the bulk of the world's population and the new center of gravity of the world, we also find in these heartlands much interest in democracy. Many newfound supporters of democracy for whom democracy is not a recipe for heaven on earth, but is a life and death matter not some fancy ideal debatable on a spring Tuesday evening in an elegant recital hall, cushioned, did you know, by rubber pads. But as villagers uh, say, for example, in India, it is a matter of land, it is a matter of running water, it's a matter of roads, a matter of electricity. For some, in Taiwan, it was a matter of refusing violence. For others, for example, in the Tibetan government in exile, it is a means of honoring the sacred, a way of solving a succession problem. That trend needs to be understood and explained. Our opponents haven't. And they've ignored another trend in this region, a counter trend, I'd say, a motley bunch of new despotisms which are proving to be powerful actors in the region. The new despotisms include states such as Iran, Saudi Arabia, Russia, the Emirates, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Burma, and China. What do these regimes have in common? More than a few petro-dictatorships, certainly. All of them are ruled by governments of the rich, wealthy, and powerful, by oligarchs, paradoxically, who speak affectionately and frequently of democracy in the people. That's as true for King Abdullah in Saudi Arabia as it is for Fijian President Ratu Josepha Iloilo, as it is true for the Chinese Communist Party. They've all latched onto the language of equality, is something new in the history of democracy. Why do they do this? Because they all sense in their guts that the age is over when people trustingly believed in good kings and queens, benevolent dictators, decent despots, good Christian gentlemen. The camouflage, of course, sometimes lands them in hot water, yet democracy is their vernacular. So it's as if in the 21st century, the whole world has become a friend of democracy. I ask, is this trembling threesome, plus maybe one or two of you in the audience, the last pocket of resistance to the trend? Yes, dear citizens and citizenesses, the flaws in their flimsy case are easy to spot. Prepare your Twitter. This is just the beginning. Less obvious and certainly more serious are the flaws I submit that destroy our honorable friend's case, if case it can be called. Think on this. Our antagonists seem to be the victims of a mirage. Lured and lost in an inversion, they fail to see that it's the planet that's failing, falling short of democracy, not the other way around. <laughs> what do they mean by democracy? What's real democracy? Well, it's for them a system that maintains a wide gap between the rich and the powerful and the powerless and the poor. It's a system that privatizes and undergirds all institutions that maintain this gap. Democracy for them is a system de defined by lackluster leadership, by bickering, you just heard it, vitriol, snail-paced decision-making, staged campaigns, and pointless elections. It's a system that's quite unlike the old communism because it means having not just one ineffective party, but at least two ineffective parties. <laughs> a system that specializes in stirring up citizen disaffection caused by their own sense of powerlessness in the face of power that rules and ruins their lives and the biomes in which we live. But this is to confuse cause and symptom. It's, lar it's large-scale planetary organizations. The Royal Bank of Scotland, Lehman Brothers, British Petroleum, and the Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, organizations that know no demo democratic accountability. They are the ones that are failing our planet and its people. Such organizations have brought us into a new age of catastrophe. Each is a cause of the crisis, for instance, that has been developing since 2007. We might speak of the Fukushima principle. It's the theme of my life and death of democracy. Unmonitored, unchecked power, especially when its footprint is massive, can ruin the lives and biomes of many hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of citizens. 
unchastened power is not only bad for the efficiency and effectiveness of business, government, and organizations like universities, power without responsibility easily degenerates in, into what our Greek ancestors called hubris. And hubris is very often the father of errors, of mistakes, of big mistakes, sometimes irreversible catastrophes, the future prevention of which requires not less but more democracy in the sense of more public scrutiny, of chastening of power wherever it is exercised. Finally, dear citizens and citizenesses, one thing to note before you cast your vote, democratically, of course. Take a look at our three democracy-shy antagonists. If I were to caricature, I'd say one of them is a former Democrat who once specialized, once specialized in keeping the bastards honest, but now has lined up with the bastards. <laughs> Another protagonist is a man whose passion for the sea and sailing has made him wise, attuned to uncertainty, and in the world of business knows the dangers of concentrated power. A long-standing supporter of citizen participation, of deliberative energy, as he's just explained, he's really a democratic sheep in wolf's clothing. But it's the third antagonist you should worry about, the philosopher. <laughs> the philosopher-scientist, the man who's right about the damage that we're unleashing on our planet, but the expert who knows he's right, who knows that catastrophe is upon us, that we have no time, that snail-paced democracy, squawking shock jocks, dictator dicta dictatorial ignorance, must all be replaced by expertocracy, by policies informed by experts like him, armed with the sword of facts. He rather reminds me of Dickens' Mr. Thomas Gradgrind, that rigid, insistent pedagogue, that square-shouldered know-all who knows what is to be done and how it is to be done. Suppose you were going to carpet a room, one of his pupils, Sissy Jupe, is asked by a visiting gentleman official and friend of Mr. Gradgrind. Would you use a carpet having a representation of flowers upon it? Sissy Jupe. If you please, sir, I am very fond of flowers. With Gradgrind, uh, breathing heavily, the official replies. And is that why you would put tables and chairs upon them and have people walking over them with heavy boots? Sissy Jupe. It wouldn't hurt them, sir. They wouldn't crush and wither, if you please, sir. They would be the pictures of what was very pretty and pleasant, and I would fancy. Stop. But you mustn't fancy, cried the gentleman official, thrilled to come to his point. That's it. You are never to fancy. You are not, Cecilia Jupe. Thomas Gradgrind repeated, to do anything of that kind. Fact, 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 said the gentleman. Fact, 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 repeated Mr. Gradgrind. Dear citizens and citizenesses, would you ever cast your vote for that kind of expert? Armed with the facts, certain of what has to be done, even if others are less convinced of his vision of expertocracy? Thank you. Well, Stephen Schwartz has told us a very instructive story about the pig with three medals and a wooden leg. Well, democracy is like a pig with three medals and a wooden leg. The three medals are personal freedoms, material advance, and the opportunity to vote out a government we don't like. As Norman May might have said, it's gold, gold, gold to democracy. <laughs> but the pig also has a wooden leg. It's limping. Just when we need a fit and healthy democratic system, we discover that the pig is lame. So the question is, who is eating the rear hind leg of democracy? <laughs> and actually, ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you where it is. It's the centrepiece of a groaning table in the flashiest restaurant in Canberra tonight. It's the succulent main course of the most powerful industry lobby group that's undermining democracy in Australia, the annual dinner of the Australian Industry Greenhouse Network. This is the most powerful lobby group that's ever been put together in Australia. It's big coal, big steel, big electricity, big mining. They're all there. And if you meet these blokes who run the Australian Industry Greenhouse Network, you'll find they're all big, tough blokes. Uh, in fact, they refer to themselves in their private conversations as the Greenhouse Mafia. And they are on a mission. As one of them said, 
um, to a researcher, a Guy Pearce, who interviewed him. He said, the reason I get out of bed in the morning is to defeat the environmentalists. And the planet, for these people, is just collateral damage. So, ladies and gentlemen, we need a new pig. Thank you. A, a, a new porcine democracy. A healthy, nimble, clever pig that will not fail the planet. Because, as George Orwell famously said, four legs good, three legs bad. <laughs> Stephen. Professor Stephen Schwartz, your two minutes begins now. Thank you. Um, our opponents say democracy is failing the planet. But what is their alternative? Well, Clive's alternative is a group of experts that need to be listened to. Now, I believe in expertise as well. But quieting down, shutting down those who have other opinions, even in science, is actually quite dangerous. From my own experience, let me give you one example. I used to be the Dean of Medicine at the University of Western Australia. One of our staff won the Nobel Prize. He won the Nobel Prize for showing that contrary to what all of the experts believe, ulcers are not caused by being nervous or having a fight at work. They're bacterial infections. Nobody believed that but him. He worked in the wilderness for a very long time, but he was right and the experts were wrong. Let's not close down a question before we're sure of the answer. Second, we have Luca. Luca wants not a, 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 a democracy made up of experts, but a democracy made up of the cast of uh, Big Brother. And, uh, and, and they would all deliberate and come up with an answer. Now, I don't know about your families, but if we had that sort of democracy in my family, every meal would be a pizza. Now, Cheryl didn't say what she wanted. She simply said she didn't like what we had. Um, my question, I guess my final remark will always come back to the famous quote by Winston Churchill, which is, democracy may be a terrible way of running government. Maybe the worst, but it's better than all the rest. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheryl Kuna, your two minutes begins well, now. Thank you. Professor Schwartz continues his preoccupation with food. In fact, I've heard more about food than democracy from him tonight. He told us previously that stupidity, not democracy, is failing the planet. So I guess in his version, then all the stupid should be denied the vote. He also said that democracies never have fanons. But truly, you and I know there are thousands of people in Western democracies who go to bed hungry regularly. Democracy does not automatically deliver food in the belly. Let's try the US. Well, then we were told that innovation will save the planet. I'm saying that too. Social innovation, the social innovation of the social entrepreneurs has as much chance of reorganizing our planet as our current democratic systems, unless they change. But just because innovation might save the planet does not mean that democracy in its current form is not failing the planet now. We heard that democracy's made us lazy. That's about us. That's about our disengagement, which has been caused, in my view, by the actual attributes of the system. The link of trust between those who do the electing and those who do the representing has been irrev irrevocably broken. Professor Keane, with his um, um, penchant for quoting the humility we need for democracy to thrive, practiced that humility when he claimed my new bastard friends. <laughs> the fact that we can't um, acknowledge that democracy can in fact be rescued. It can be changed. It can be made with its four-legged pig to serve the will of social justice and equality better. Thank you.
Martine Letts. So I'm going to stick to my role of being the straight person among all these comics. Uh, what I hear from Luca Belgiorno Nettis is um, sort of sounds a lot to me like a return to perhaps um, the reign of the Medici family um, <laughs> that will invest wisely and guide us wisely. Um, there were many qualities of the Medici family, but uh, I think we can take the best from that and uh, make a decision about whether we want that system or not in a democracy. Clive Hamilton spoke about the role of science and this appalling business of rejecting the opinion of scientists and uh, that uh, this was hurting the planet and democracy was responsible. The way he was talking about, uh, about certain uh, people that ignore science, I thought he was actually talking about the Greens when I think about their attitude to things like nuclear energy, the best form of baseload energy now to protect us from greenhouse gas emissions, and their position on things like genetically modified organisms. I mentioned at the end of my presentation that one of the most important aspects of democracy is the enfranchisement of women. And there are still many, many women in most developed and autocratic countries that don't have the right to speak and to vote. And I think Cheryl, my dear opponent, he will agree with me. Uh, women have been proven to be good negotiators and whenever there's been a woman at the table in a peace building or uh, in, in cooperation, the result has usually been better. Let's give democracy a chance to be fully functional by liberating 50% of the world's productive potential. And finally, uh, Australia and its position in the world where the centre of power, economic and political and strategic power is moving to our region. For the first time in Australia's history, our main strategic partner, the United States, is not the same as our major economic partner, China. It will be very interesting to see how we manage our future, where uh, the biggest strategic influence will be China, which is no longer a democracy. I think, if I may quote from a previous RQ Square debate, like Leonard Cohen said, you may not like what comes after America. Thank you. Luca Belgiorno Nettis. Thank you, Simon. Um, <clears throat> the proposition is that democracy is failing the planet. W what we're arguing is that the way we practice democracy now is failing the planet. Of course, it's a much better system than a Russian duopoly or a Burmese military dictatorship. All we are suggesting is that we can do better. I don't think anyone should argue about, would argue with that. So. The proposition is how do we think about doing it better? But I think it helps to actually understand how we got to where we got to. And I think when you really look at the history of where democracy was started, at least democracy as we know it, which is the American founding father's democracy, let's just remember, as they said, they rejected the very word democracy. They rejected the word democracy. They didn't want to refer to the Greek democracy. They selected the term natural aristocracy. And with that, they gave the vote. They voted, they privileged themselves as the elite landed gentry to be voted in, to be the voter and to be the potential candidates for office. Now, that sort of set up a a rather contentious process to start, adversarial process to start with, but it was inherently adversarial by the very fact that it disenfranchised all those non-landed gentry people. In fact, there's an argument to say, which I, I use, and I'm not sure many people would, would uh, uh, subscribe to it, but you could argue that the Americans actually were the catalyst for socialism because if they've disenfranchised all those people who didn't have the vote, they've been struggling all those centuries, bloody warfare, to get to, the, get to the point to be considered as the same as, as, as the natural arist aristocrats. We just think we can do better, that's all. Thank you. John Keane. Well, I'm not sure what the state of voting is, but I, I have observed that um, our op our opponents have actually just caved in. I mean, they all, they're all for democracy, just not in the present form. They'd like some other forms, but so, you know, that should be the end of my remarks. But 
I can't resist. Um, <laughs> I can't resist surprise, uh, surprise. Attempting, a, attempting a pirouette uh, to say two things. One is lots of unfinished uh, business in matters of democracy to do with the taming, chastening of power. The great struggle in the 19th and early 20th centuries was for the vote, for the universalization of the franchise. That was the old democracy. The unfinished business, uh, I mentioned it briefly in, with respect to Fukushima and BP and so on, is uh, that we've entered a period of very large-scale organizations, immensely powerful, with tremendously wide footprints. And if things go wrong, they have irreversible, uh, catastrophic effects. And it's the lack of accountability in those organizations that is, I think, uh, the terrain of the coming uh, democracy. Uh, and it's, diff it's a different problem than existed uh, uh, hitherto. You, you look at figures like Jimmy Kane, the CEO of Bear Stearns. He wasn't a Hitler-type figure. He happened to be the richest man on Wall Street who would take his private helicopter off on Thursday afternoons and play golf and smoke joints. Did he care that uh, Wall Street uh, came to the point of collapse? No. It's that kind of unbridled hubris that, uh, that uh, I think is the new frontier of democracy. Second remark, very briefly, democracy is unusual because it disappoints. And it opens, it owns up to its own disappointments. We're always chasing it around corners, up stairwells, into blue skies. And it's that disappointment that we should not confuse with its shortcomings. We can do things to breathe life back in to democracy. Thank you. you to, even before you've heard the results, to thank our marvellous panel of speakers. Clive Hamilton, Cheryl Kearney, Luca Vigano, and us, Stephen Schwartz, Martin Metz, and John Key. <laughs> Just one other thing. Uh, of course, there'll be a series next year. Um, what we're thinking to do uh, is to invite you to contribute suggestions for debates that you might like to have staged here in Sydney. Uh, I'll give you just a few of the ones that we're thinking of. Um, things like that abortion should be legalised uh, because it's not legal uh, in New South Wales and in most states and territories of Australia. That there's nothing wrong with designer babies. That our national interest has been sacrificed on the altar of free trade. Western civilization is in terminal decline. We will live to regret the rise of China. To so these are the sorts of things. If there's something that you're thinking, mm, yeah, that sounds a bit right, or if you've got other ideas that you think are uh, equally or more interesting than that, it would be great to know. And we'll send subscribers a link so that you can express a view. And if you aren't a subscriber, you can sort of track down the website, www.iq2.oz, to find that. And of course, if you're Twittering, you can go to uh, twitter.com slash iq2oz. Now, the results. The last results for 2011. The pre-debate poll results were as follows. Wow, okay, so that's pretty interesting. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, I enjoy that private moment of reflection here. <laughs> um, before the debate, uh, it was 27.5% against the motion, but it was virtually tied in undecided and for. So 36.3% were for the motion, undecided 36.2%. So, you know, a, a really big number to, to argue for. Oh. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> Look, the undecided were 36.2%. They're now down to 10.3%. Yeah. <laughs> and the result, with 38.5% for, I declare with 51.2% of the vote, the against side have won the debate. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.
Thank you for your support for the debates. I hope you'll join us next year. I now declare this debate to be closed. This is Big Ideas from the ABC.